On behalf of the Hood Museum of Art, welcome to the tonight's lecture, the work of artist Kwame Brathwaite. A presentation about the work and archive of Kwame Brathwaite by his son, Kwame S. Brathwaite. A brief Q&A will take place near the end of the program. And hello, my name is Anthony Fosun, and I'm a senior studying government with minors in public policy and human-centered design. I'm also a musical artist, and along my roles in NAACP and elsewhere in the black community, I also share a deep appreciation for Kwame Brathwaite's work. His legacy extends far beyond the black is beauty mantra, true as it is. Indeed, his work speaks to the powerful remedies of diverse beauty and expression presence in the African diaspora one exemplified through historical and contemporary influences of African and African-American culture on music, visual art, photography, and so much more. In line with the Dartmouth Black Legacy Month theme, Melanin Mosaic, Brathwaite was able to weave together the many stories of the communities he photographed, showing each person in their full complexity and as part of a complex collective that speaks to the beauty of our shared humanity. His passing this past year represented a profound loss for our community and the world of art. May he rest in peace and power. My thanks to the Hood Museum for bringing Kwame S. Brathwaite to speak more about the impact of his father's art. And at this time, I would also like to ask everyone to turn off their cell phones and set them on silent. Um, and please note the emergency exit to my left and those at the back of the auditorium. And now, I am pleased to invite Mr. John Stomber, the Virginia Rice Kelsey 1961S Director of the Hood Museum to the podium. I don't know, maybe I should just let him come by. <laughs> that, that was a hard act to follow. A beautiful introduction. Uh, I really just have two short announcements to make. Uh, the first is that we're in the Gilman Auditorium, and it was actually the Gilman Family Fund that sponsored the exhibition and, and talks that we're enjoying tonight. And uh, so I like to always thank the, the many donors who help us out here. And I also wanted to say that it's important for us to always remember that the land that Dartmouth and the Hood are situated upon was unceded land of the Abenaki people. And for many, many millennia, their ancestors fished uh, in these waters and hunted in these woods. And it's important that we always remember that. And we try not and simply have this be a once a month reminder that we say by rote, but actually have it inform our daily practice. And I can testify that I think we do make an ongoing effort for this. So when you hear this testimony at the beginning of a lecture, it's actually connected, we hope, to action and not empty testimony, uh, which these can be. So we thank uh, the Abenaki for continuing to uh, tolerate our presence on these lands. And we welcome um, people of all Native American tribes to join with the Hood on the adventure that we are on in celebrating culture and art that is so important to us. So with that said, I am very, very pleased and proud to present our curator of photography, our associate curator of photography, uh, Elisa Sundell, uh, who has really been changing things up for us. She's made brilliant acquisitions, as you'll see in her shows. She's made brilliant uh, lectures. She's made partnerships and friendships across campus and across the country. And uh, we couldn't be more thrilled than all of the work that Elisa is doing. So please give me a nice round of applause for Elisa Swindell. They never said these were short people. <laughs> so and I have the privilege of introducing our speaker tonight, Kwame S. Braithwaite. He is the son of photographer Kwame Braithwaite, and he is the director of the Kwame Braithwaite Archive. 
He manages the archive as well as collaborative projects that are coordinate with the themes in his father's work, namely activism, politics, fashion, and music. Kwame Samori authored a chapter entitled Fashion and Consciousness in the book Mod, New York City, Fashion Takes a Trip, and an article entitled A Look at Life Through My Father's Lens for National Geographic. He has lectured at numerous institutions, including Harvard Art Museum, we don't talk about them, um, <laughs> the Courtauld Institute, University of Southern California, Christie's and Google, among others. He co-curated Celebrity and the Everyday Life at Philip Martin Gallery, curated Black is Beautiful, the photography of Kwame Braithwaite, a touring exhibition in, um, done in partnership with the Aperture Foundation. The struggle continues, victory is certain, changing times, in my village, New York. Kwame Sumori is also a real estate professional, graduated from Amherst College with a BA in law, jurisprudence, and social thought, and received his MBA from USC's Marshall School of Business. He currently serves on the board of trustees for Aperture, the Aperture Foundation, and the Polytechnic School in Pasadena, California. He is originally from New York and currently lives in San Marino, California with his wife and three children. Please help me welcome to the podium, Kwame Esprit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's um, lovely to see you all. Thank you for coming out. Um, Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Anthony's hard to follow. I don't know. I think he should just do the presentation. Um, I, th I wanted to come up here, and, and I'm going to go a little bit off script because I'm with the best and the brightest. So I want to kind of engage with you a little bit more than just kind of telling you a story. Um, but with that, um, I'm going to be presenting this work, the impact that it's had um, in the past and what we're looking to in the future. Also the contemporary kind of uh, things that are happening with us in the archive now. Uh, I started the Kwame Brathwaite Archive as a 501c3 because I think it's really important for the information to continue to live past me, past my son Jackson. My oldest is here actually visiting with me, uh, looking at school. So uh, if you see him talk, talk up the school, we need to. Uh, <laughs> get some, some further inspiration. Um, he's into computer science. Um, but yeah, so I think it's really important that um, the work that we're doing uh, continues on. And it's, it goes past me, it goes past all of us. So, as Elisa said, I'm a SVP of real estate and director of the archive. Um, I'm gonna go through how it started, kind of the archive a bit, the impact and our path forward. So who am I? Um, I'm a New Yorker. It only comes out when I say stuff like water, but I'm a New Yorker. I've been in California for the last 17 years. We moved out of Half Jackson. Uh, we have two others, Carter and Kennedy. Uh, some good stories about them, but they're actually all helping us in the archival process. So it's really beautiful to see this legacy go from grandfather to now grandchildren. Um, uh, I'm a Gen Xer, you know, 90s teen. Born in the 70s. It's so funny, I saw, I saw something on Instagram where a teacher said um, a student started their um, essay with, in the early, in the late 1900s. And I was like, oh man, come on. <laughs> that's, that's what we used to say. Um, went to Dalton uh, in New York, grew, uh, was a wonderful experience. That actually shaped part of my father's journey and my journey through this. Uh, and. One of the things that's really interesting about it is that this process, we've been doing it for the last 10 years, has been pretty organic. Uh, so there have, been, um, there have been instances where you meet someone, all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, we should be talking about this, we should be working together. Even the way that this whole thing started, um, and I'll get into that, was through our middle son uh, and a friendship that he had. Went to Amherst, um, I never, Consider Dartmouth. I'm, as, as we walked around today, um, we did a, a self-guided tour, uh, rethinking that a bit. 
but I did meet my wife there, so you know it works. Um, USC MBA. I did the executive MBA program uh, a few years back. That was a wonderful experience. And uh, 20 years in real estate, and now the director of the archives. So, um, and then the other things in your life, you know, the life stuff. So, um, about me, I'm an eternal optimist. I'm a connector of people. I love making connections. I love making collaborations. It's part of why this work is so important. My father had the name Keeper of the Images. Uh, he, people would always say, he was the one that if there was an event, he was there. He was taking those pictures. He wanted to document the, the experience, not just the African American experience, but the experience uh, throughout the African diaspora around the world. Uh, and I feel like I'm now the second keeper. But in doing so, uh, my role is really to connect my father's generation with the up and coming generation of artists that are and creatives that are part of this um, part of this kind of whole ethos. So how did we get here? So it was really interesting. Uh, you know, my father's been doing this since 1956, or had been doing this since 1956. I was in New York. We're living a mile and a half away. You know, you're going about your life. So I'm a real estate person. I'm you know trying to go through my career, and uh, they were visiting us in 2014, and actually it's 2013, and he pulled out two pictures out of a Manila envelope, literally just a Manila envelope, and it was like you know, these little eight by 10s. And it was this picture of Muhammad Ali a couple of days before the Romulan jungle in Kinshasa. Beautiful image. Um, it kind of like floored me. Uh, and then this image, and it's the Righteous Brothers, David Bowie, Yoko Ono, John Lennon, and Roberta Flack backstage at the Grammys in 1975. I'm like, what is going on here? Why do you have these? And why have I never seen these? And he looked at me like, I have so many images you've never seen before. What do you mean? And so my wife, Robin, and I looked at each other and said, okay, we have to do something about this because we realized, like most artists, artists are artists, right? They are really amazing at making their art. But, you know, the cataloging, the organization part, that was not there. Um, and so we said, this is something that we really need to help them with. Uh, and to go quickly into this story about my middle son, so... It, it so happened that when my son Carter was on the playground at his new school uh, in, this is like pre-K, um, he was playing with a friend. And the dad walks over, this guy's name is Philip Martin. So he introduces himself and he goes, hi, my name is Philip. I said, oh, my name is Kwame. He goes, oh, you know where the name comes from? Of course I know where the name comes from. You know, it's from Ghana. My father uh, changed his name to Kwame, named me Kwame. He goes, oh, that's so funny. And I said, because he followed Kwame Nkrumah. He goes, that's so funny. Now, Philip is a 6'3 Caucasian man from Indiana. He goes, oh, that's so funny. Kwame Nkrumah imprisoned my father. Mm -hmm. I said, what? <laughs> His parents were African linguists. And so we got to talking. And over the course of Playdate dinners, Philip Martin is the head of Philip Martin Gallery at the time. It was Cherry Martin, one of the most you know, renowned galleries in the world. We just happened to become friends because our kids were friends. And in working with him, he was the gallery that really got us started on the kind of fine art path, really kind of introduced us to Aperture and some of the other things that were happening. So it was really just these, these things that happen in your life. And sometimes you have to be open to it and really receive. And you, you will all appreciate this. So the day that we were kind of trying to figure out whether we were going to work together, it was the night that Beyonce was performing in the Rose Bowl. Another friend of my wife's had tickets to a suite that she got from Beyonce and was like, hey, come to, the, come to the concert. And we were like, this is what we've been working on. This, this, we were having dinner with Philip and his, and his wife. And we're like, no, I think we need to go to the dinner. Yeah, maybe we should have gone to the concert, but we went to the dinner and that actually started the path to where we are now. Um, the first time I actually talked about my father's work was at an Amherst reunion that I had a few years back, and it was just a small group of people. Uh, and since then, it's been, a, it's been an honor and a pleasure to kind of go through this um, in this way. So these were the images that, in the beginning, people really got to know us for. Uh, the top left image is uh, the oranges of my mother. Uh, we made sure it was the cover of the book that came out in 2019, 
which is now in its fifth edition. Uh, the self-portrait, I think every photographer has to have that, you know, kind of key self-portrait that he took, I think he was 24 at the time. Um, the bottom left image, uh, the blue afro, that one was really kind of a catalyst as well because a lot of people got to know that image in the last few years. Uh, it is now in an exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum called Giants. It's the work of uh, the Dean Collection, Swiss Beats and Lisa Keys, who have collected. They actually have the, the, the two on the left. And then um, the bottom right is my Aunt Noomsa. And she was one of the Grand Dassel models who I'll go into a little bit uh, later. But that, actually, that image was the first time we'd actually printed uh, in a scale that my father wanted to go to. As you know, he's, he started shooting 56, like I said. He was um, limited by the technology and the means to pr produce at a, at a large scale. These images now can be printed, we do them at a five by five, five feet by five feet. Uh, so it's really, really um, impactful. Uh, and then, you know, uh, a fun fact about the blue image, I, Radia Fry, uh, was a model in the 70s and she just had done a studio session with him. Uh, she, there's a Barbie actually created after her uh, and, it's, and it's part of the Harley Davidson, uh, the line of uh, models and it's really amazing to see how much that image is really taking off. It's been in so much press. Uh, and so I, I just love the fact that this is really, you know, the foundation of what we started 10 years ago. So. I'm gonna ask a question. I think this is where I get a little bit interactive. So, um, how many students do we have in the room? If you're a student, can you raise your hand? Okay. First years? Second year? Third? Fourth? All right. Um, we are in a time when you look back at what, um, when you think about the, the whole uh, like innovation or you think about the ways in which um, you know, people always say, you're young, you can make change. How do you make change in the world? Uh, I, th I think back to my time as an 18, 19 year old and um, you know, you're in school, you're doing what you're doing, you're, you're kind of figuring out who you are. The thing that was amazing about these gentlemen here was that in 1956, they were just out of high school and they decided to form this group, the African Jazz Art Society, um, which was revolutionary in a number of ways. So the, the goal of the African Jazz Art Society was primarily, one, it's 1956. African-American people are still referring to themselves as Negro. So to call themselves African Jazz Art Society, they wanted to make the connection back to Africa. They wanted to, um, they wanted to acknowledge their ancestry. So that was one. Uh, two, Jazz was our hip hop. So they wanted to establish themselves as uh, being part of this new music, this new kind of era of music that was going on. Um, the other thing that was really interesting at 18, 19 years old, they were all creatives. So we had graphic artists. My father actually got hit when he was in high school. He, was, he focused on graphic arts. Um, Bob Gums was a graphic artist. Frank Adu was an actor. Uh, Alami Brath, who is my uncle, um, he was a graphic artist as well, my father, and then Ernest Baxter and Chris Hall were both uh, illustrators. And so they came together and they wanted to kind of really focus in on music, right? Um, in doing so, and this ideology of, you know, embracing Africa, they kind of took on Garveyism. Uh, and Garveyism, uh, Marcus Garvey, Jamaican immigrant, who talked about embracing that ancestry, but also this entire Back to Africa movement. Although Garvey wasn't around when they had started this, Carlos Cooks had taken the helm and he was the head of the African Nationalist Pioneer Movement. He influenced them in many ways from their ideological views as well as um, kind of the way they thought about how they wanted to impact the world. They wanted to bring the diaspora together in many ways. Um, this is the iconic kind of Black is Beautiful poster that was put together uh, in 1970. As you can see, uh, there are all women in these letters. My mother and my sister, this is prior to my birth, um, are up in the K. Um, and a lot of these models are now back together. 
interacting with each other. The ones that are that are still with us are back together, and they are actually starting a second generation, the next generation of Grandassa models. To explain the Grandassa models, the Grandassa models were a group of women from the community uh, who had embraced this ID, ID, idea of um, embracing your African ancestry. And that meant the way that you wore your hair, the way that you carried yourself, um, kind of shunning this Eurocentric beauty standard uh, and really embracing who you are as an African, a displaced African. And so these were women who in an, Janu on January 20th, 1962, uh, they were, um, they put on a show. And these were shows that A-Jazz were doing. And originally they were jazz shows. They would put together jazz musicians and have them perform because again, in 56 and 62, they weren't able to perform in their neighborhoods up in Harlem and the Bronx. So they would go down to where they ate, find the musicians, pull them together and put together, because they knew jazz, they could put together a really beautiful show. Uh, and in doing so, they would also do things like have poetry, so spoken word. There would be um, satire, so there'd be like comedic skits about what was happening in the world. And so that was all happening. And, and typically when you would go to a show during that time, it would usually be something like a burlesque dancer or something like that. And they wanted to be more highbrow. So they had, um, they had, um, what they did was they did things like African drummers and did African dancers and they wanted to embrace and, and bring the community, the diaspora to the community. So they, uh, they ended up doing that. And when they debuted the Grandassa models in January 28th, 1962, it was the first time you'd seen women wearing their hair natural, little to no makeup, uh, really being uh, put forth as being beautiful. Uh, that was the birth of the Black is Beautiful movement. Um, and in, in promoting that show, one of the things that they said they ha that happened in the community, both out, you know, it was mostly African-American people who, were, who they were dealing with in Harlem and abroad. They were saying, come to this show. And they said, you know, wait, these women are not gonna have their hair done? They're like, no, they're gonna have their hair done. It's just gonna be different than what, you, what you're used to. Um, so many people showed up that first night that they had to do a second show, and a second unplanned show, because there's so many people waiting outside. Um, you talk about the way in which you can change people's minds about what is the norm and what um, is accepted. Um, not too long ago at the Brooklyn Library, they were celebrating the Grand Assa models. And one of the women spoke about her journey as a Grand Assa model and how when she started wearing her hair natural, her mother, who had been deeply ingrained with this Eurocentric standard, um, tried to kill herself because she felt that she had not, you know, passed on the right way of doing things. Um, she said it impacted her very much. Toward the end of her life, she finally understood like why she was doing it and what it meant um, and how important it was. But when that shift happened and for that particular model, she said she knew that she was doing what was right because it was something that was deep within her and she felt it in her spirit. And so um, oftentimes in, during the touring exhibition that we had a few years back, you would have people coming to the work and seeing this work and, and having these visceral responses. Black is beautiful, everyone knows the phrase. Some people love the phrase, some people think it's, you know, they, they have different responses to it. So whether you believe it or not, it, the impact that they had uh, it's part of our, it's part of the natural lexicon at this point. And so one of the things that was really important for me was to make sure that people understand the journey and the road to how that all came about. One of the things that was really critical during the time when they were kind of building out these shows, so they started in Harlem and the Bronx and they started going to Chicago and Detroit and some other cities, Lincoln University. So there's always this educational part of being in colleges and universities. They credit um, three kind of jazz greats with really helping them really start the thing. Miles Davis was one of the early supporters. He actually helped fund a jazz and make sure that things were happening. And then Max Roach and Abby Lincoln, um, who are, Max Roach is arguably the greatest jazz drummer of all time. Um, and Abby Lincoln, uh, one of the most uh, political, beautiful voices of that era, um, she, uh, was already on record with 
kind of shunning, you know, Hollywood and some of the things because they wanted her to straighten her hair when she was performing these roles. And so one of the things that happened was when they connected with Asia, as they really found a place that they felt that they could support. And so when they went out and did their tours and concerts, they would oftentimes be talking about Asia as and promoting things so that they could then come in. So they were the uh, they were the influences of that time. Um, my father's journey started with Ajaz, and one of the things that happened was they were, uh, their studio was on 125th Street in Harlem, just a couple doors down from the Apollo Theater. When they were doing all these um, kind of small jazz shows that they were putting together, they made friends with all the artists. And so oftentimes, um, my father had the opportunity to shoot these album covers. So these album covers that he shot, um, as I said, that's my aunt Numsa. But when you think back to jazz covers during that time, they were usually the artists themselves playing the instrument or a very, very scantily clad woman, right? Because they were selling jazz and they were selling sax, right? So one of the things that was really kind of revolutionary about this, and Blue Note credit them with putting these, putting these covers out, was that these images of Grand Assel models um, became a change in kind of a shift in ideology, a shift in kind of culture. Um, and I actually just recently did a search on Discogs to kind of see how many, how many covers my father shot. And I realized that as Ronnie Brathwaite, which was his, um, the name he went by before he changed his name to Kwame, he had 22. And as Kwame Brathwaite, he had 33. So he shot about 50 plus album covers, notes, sleeves, and things like that. So that was a really big part of his journey. As you may or may not know, um, the art world at that time <laughs> wasn't so accepting of one African-American artist, but also photography as an, as an art form, right? It was painting, it was sculpture, it was kind of, you know, art, things like that. But it wasn't, um, it wasn't photography. So he made his living through the album covers, photo shoots, you know, photo shoots of people off the sh on the street, photo shoots of people who wanted to become models. And then he also did a lot of document documentary photos as well as um, fashion and politics. I'm just gonna go through some of the images. Uh, this is a, a, a wonderful image. And, and, and in doing this project, one of the things that was really amazing for me is that I sometimes find out who people are after We've printed the picture. So we did this picture and this woman's cousin wrote in and said, oh, that's my cousin. She passed. Her name was Olive. She used to go and watch the street speakers all the time. This is on 125th Street. And if you have never seen an image of a street speaker, it would be kind of like Malcolm X or these people kind of get on this ladder and they would just kind of talk to people, just talk to people, tell them about what was going on in the world, tell them about what was happening politically. Um, and so it was really, I, I love this image because it's this woman in the sea of all these men. She's clearly informed. She has the New York Times in her hand and she's paying attention to what's going on in the world. So <laughs> women leading the way as always. Um, these are two just amazing images that I felt like are, are indicative of kind of like the Harlem Street Live. This was a Wigs Parisian protest. Wigs Parisian was a um, wig shop that had um, come into Harlem that they protested, uh, as as I, as you as they said, you know they were they were into natural beauty, and then some other images. That image on the right, uh, DDR car, has become kind of an iconic image for us as well. I love the fact that it's so colorful in the front and like really kind of muted in the back. Um, I love the impact that she's having on these these children, like. It was a Garvey Day parade they were riding through, and you know, they're just like in awe. Um, these are images from a show that just closed in 2023. That was a traveling show in Aperture. It was, um, this was in New York. These were some of the fashions that were actually worn by some of the models, uh, and then the, the imagery in the background. So, um, I feel like, you can read this, but the work has had an impact and I feel like what's happened over the last 10 years 
uh, has be, really been uh, kind of learning. I remember first doing this and doing a Google search and putting my father's name in and all these different permutations of other people coming up and there was nothing to be found. Um, I then re reached out to some of the kind of experts in the field and although they knew my father's work from the kind of celebrity and music and some of those things, they had no idea about his influence in Black is Beautiful and, 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 and that whole thing. So it was really amazing to kind of help people understand um, and learn. Uh, coffee Seal Books is in the fifth printing. Um, the work is in 13, uh, actually now 14 museums in, uh, and institutions internationally. Um, I've had the opportunity to come in spaces like this and, and speak to, to young people, which is really at the heart of what I love to do. Um, and then I was just, it was really funny. There was a, there was a young artist who, um, who wrote a movie. He, he wrote a short film. And it was based off of him going to see that exhibition that I just had on the screen. Comes to find out that his sister is in class with my son, my other son, Carter. Uh, and he's a, he's a young NYU graduate filmmaker. And he said, I saw that and I literally had to write this movie. It was a movie about this jazz musician who was talking about his relationship with his father. Um, and so just kind of really beautiful. Um, and you know, in this time of erasure, in this time where um, people are changing histories, I think it's really important that you know, our tradition, which is an oral one, uh, there are images that match that, that actually give you context and give you the ability to kind of understand what was going on and who was part of that uh, journey. Uh, these are the works uh, that are in the Hood Collection, which um, thank you all for being part of it. I think um, it's an honor for me uh, to be able to see the works in other places. Um, obviously for me, it is, um, it's important and it's part of like, you know, the natural flow of things, of doing business as a, as a, as a archive. But the thing that is incredible for me is when the works are actually out and people get to see them and experience them and have their own interactions and interpretation of what that work means to them. Because we all come from different backgrounds, we all have different kind of um, thoughts around what something is. And so um, I, I like the subjectivity and the ability to get in front of people from all different backgrounds so that it can have an impact. Uh, this is actually a variation, uh, same photo shoot of the Hood Quarterly image that's up now, um, changing times, um, I love that. And then this is actually uh, from Revelations, an Alvin Ailey dance performance. Uh, and actually, that actually was a connection through my high school uh, where my father, although he knew Alvin Ailey when he debuted, um, he then started doing their annual gala and so uh, this is from one of those. And then the impact. Um, and we can, we can kind of talk about this a little bit now, but I think, um, or later, but I, I love the fact that um, what's happening now is that people are starting to embrace the work. During the pandemic, we got a lot, I got a lot of DMs in Instagram about people going to the work as a place for respite, like a place to kind of recharge and the imagery that they were seeing on TV versus the imagery that was in the book uh, was really important to them. Um, got a chance to kind of hang out and, and meet some cool people. Um, it's really um, celebrating his work. Uh, and oftentimes it's, uh, you know, Amy Sherrill, uh, her work is just absolutely amazing, obviously. Sarah Elizabeth Lewis, um, she's an incredible young person in this uh, space. So it's really, it's really amazing to be able to kind of experience this work. And then uh, when Rihanna dropped her Fenty clothing line, she referenced my father's imagery, um, which really kind of took us on an entirely different journey. Uh, get, talk about an influencer. Um, and then Swiss Beach and Alicia Keys have three of the images in their Iron Man house garage. So it's, it's always nice too. Um, so um, one of the things that we do uh, at the archive is we're trying to preserve his work, we're trying to educate others, and we're trying to support the next generation of artists that kind of really love and, and, and uphold beauty, uphold empowerment, and uphold equality. So um, that's, I think that's it in a nutshell. So thank you.
Okay, so I get to do the first questions before we turn it over to all of you. Um, so one of the things that I found, that I find so wonderful about what you're doing is that um, few artists, and especially African American artists, are taught to have a succession plan. Um, had a horrible moment with trying to find who owns the copyright for Ernest Critchlow's work. You know, this is a major African American artist. He had a, a, a one person show at MoMA just a few years ago. Um, and at the Met, and I reached out to them, and they had worked with him when he was still alive, and they didn't know who owned the copyright anymore either. Um, so the fact that you're here, you have the archive, you're taking care of it. What does it mean to make sure that an artist has that type of planning, that there's going to be someone to look after the work? Uh, yeah, it's interesting. In, in, in the 10 years that I've been doing this, uh, I've actually run into that quite a bit, where you've had this next generation. And so, like I said before, like I was in that same space, right? Had my father passed 10 years earlier, we would, we would be in that same situation. Um, I think the, it's really important, and oftentimes because you're dealing with artists, they don't want to give up that either control or you know they, they don't want people dealing with their work. In fact, it took my mother a year to convince my father to allow me to work with the work. Uh, and she was like, wait, you have to let him do this. Like, there's, this is really important. Uh, I've actually had other people come to me and say, I need you to help me do the same thing with my work. I don't have children. Um, and I've, I've started to kind of like advise people on what, what to do. But also now, the next generation, one of my good friends from high school, actually, it's funny, in my class um, in high school was uh, Malenka Clark, so Ed Clark's daughter, and uh, Bruce Davidson's daughter, Anna. And Bruce is still alive, but Ed just passed. And so when Ed passed, Malenka was like, I, I need you to help me with this. And so we started talking through what that meant, what that meant and what that looks like. It's, it's incredibly important because, you know, part of the reason I went back and got my MBA was to understand how to even do this, right? I was, you know, negotiating leases in the CAM, you know, that type of stuff. And I, I really wanted to understand, one, how do you, how do you properly go into this world, uh, and two, how do you make sure that all of this lifelong work is protect, protected first? If you can then figure out a way to, you know, make it an efficient business or make it something that's um, worth that artist's time, it's really incredible. I remember my father saying to me, um, I have amassed this incredible collection. I've not really figured out how to make that this, this treasure for you, but I want this for my grandchildren. I want this for them. Um, so how, help me, like help me figure that out. And I think his openness to do that was really a key factor, but it, it's incredibly important to have a successful plan because oftentimes what will happen is people will pass, there'll be some people that come in and grab the work and all of a sudden you have, you know, the Finding Vivian Mayer thing, which, they found all of her work in an estate sale. And then the person like really wants to promote it, and then later on, you know, people come out of the woodworks, oh, that was mine. You know, so it's really important that this work is preserved because everyone has a story to tell. Everyone in this room has a story to tell, right? Your journey is something that's really important. You have family histories that, you know, oftentimes you want to tell it. Maybe someone's a quilter, maybe someone collects dolls. Like, all of that is really important because it's all a part of what makes us who we are. So for me, I think it's, it's incredibly important. I think, you know, artists who have that second generation really try to get their, their, uh, their, their children to kind of step in or just at least have some sort of plan that works because, you know, copyright for photography, I think is 70 years post death. So there is something that has to be done and then how do you, how do you work through that? Um, and along with that importance, and as you've been getting it out, the Martin Gallery's been working to get it out. Um, Aperture did great things in, in spreading the word. But how important is it 
to you and to the archive to see these works in museum collections and especially collections like ours in academic museums? Uh, thank you for that. I, I, I think that's actually the most important part of what, for me. Um, I love the fact that, you know, Rihanna and Jesse Williams and Jay-Z and Swiss, all these people are collecting the work, but they live in their house. How many people are going to see those works, right? There's some people who are different who will show, like the fact that Giants is now touring at the Brooklyn Museum. That's an opportunity for something that they've lived with. Swiss and Alicia McKees have lived with all of this time, seeing it outside for the first time. It's actually stunning, but you don't usually have that opportunity. The places where people get to go are the academic institutions, they are the museums. And so if you want people to experience the work, which is my primary thing, I want, I want everyday people to understand this story. So, and it's why, you know, the book was so important with Aperture. Um, I remember in doing that, my father, I remember he wanted to self-publish. I said, look, you can have 100% of 100 books or 1,000 books, or we can have a smaller percentage, but we can reach more people so that the story, the truth, comes out and the story is told. And so he's like, okay, I, I see that. I see that logic. But I think it's, it's the, the best moments for me when people tag me and their children. It's like that Obama hair touch moment, right? It's like people are seeing themselves. You can't be what you can't see. So if people are seeing themselves, and, and we talked about this briefly, I, I, got a, I got a DM from the woman who started Black Girls in Art Spaces. And she said she started Black Girls in Art Spaces, which is a national group that now goes and visits different museums in different cities. She started it because she had come to my father's exhibition through Aperture. It was the first time she felt welcome in an institution like that. And so for me, those are the stories that, like, those are the things that make me kind of, you know, they get, I get the chills. And it's, it's why we started doing this work in the first place. It's, you know, Jackson's friends coming over and helping with the archive. Um, you know, people from different backgrounds seeing the work. Oh, and, 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 you know, it was really funny because you never know how people are gonna react to the work. And so I, I was getting, it was during the pandemic, we'd ordered DoorDash. And the guy comes up, and so at the time, you know, you had to go out to, to get the food. And so he drives up, his windows are down, and he's talking to his friend. And then I walk up to the car, and he's like, hey, man. And this is like a young punk, punk rock guy. He's got his, like, tats on his face. He's got the, you know, the huge the ear piercings. And he goes, dude, you have the same name as my favorite photographer. And I'm like, that's my dad. He goes, shut the F up, are you crazy? <laughs> Like, I saw this exhibition. I like photography. I went out with my friends. We started shooting like portrait style stuff. It was so crazy. And I was like, oh, that, that means everything to me. But it, and it does. Like, those are the things that really um, make me like appreciate why we're doing this. And then as he's driving off, her, his friend that has stopped talking is like, dude. Like, he starts screaming. So it was like one of those moments where you're just like, you're having an impact. Sometimes you don't see, sometimes you're doing work, you're doing, you're grinding, you're like doing what you're supposed to do. But when you see those things and you see people post from museum shows and people post from, you know, exhibitions at our, you know, colleges, universities, those are the things that really kind of keep me, you know, really inspired to go and, and help me. You see, you see he's here with the camera. So like, those are the things that help us keep going, so. Where'd Sharon go? Do I have time for one more, or should we open it up? OK. Um, so the artist Elizabeth Catlett is quoted as having said, we have to create an art for liberation and for life. So you know, your father's art seems to be really working towards similar goals. And can you tell me how that sort of manifested in his life as well as his work? Uh, you know. In doing the work, obviously there was the, okay, you know, if you look my father up, you'll see images like these, then you'll see like images of Stevie Wonder and Michael Jackson and all these different people, right? In doing the work, at the core of everything was really this 
um, showing us in our in our beauty, showing us in our regalness. But the underlying part of the Black is Beautiful movement was they were um, connecting with NGOs, non-governmental organizations in African countries that had not been liberated yet, and working with those countries to help fight for their liberation. So most people get caught up in, you know, the phrase black is beautiful, and they're thinking, oh, it's about, you're talking about beauty. The underlying part of black is beautiful was um, liberation. And so uh, we were going through the archive uh, a couple months ago, and we found a piece of paper where it showed the NGOs listed, and there's a check mark next to the ones that had been liberated. And it was, you know, I think around mid 80s. So, you know, we had the ones that they were, and they were, they were, it was like, you know, your, your checklist or your, your, so I, the fact that that was part of what he was tracking, right? He wasn't tracking like, how many sales did I make? He wasn't tracking like, how many supermodels have I shot? It was, what countries are liberated? Where are we going? How can we document this? What is the work that needs to be done um, to continue in this liberation path? So it's, it's, it was at the core of his being, um, and the work was just the kind of visual manifestation of that. First of all, thank you very much for um, this wonderful presentation. I want to steer you back to the picture of Muhammad Ali. Uh, you made reference to the boxing, the, the fight in Zaire, rumble in the jungle. Um, and um, I wonder if your father um, spoke um, about that event. It sounds to me like he was there since you said he captured that moment with Muhammad Ali a few days before the fight. Um, as you know, uh, that fight was so iconic, uh, you know, between two Americans who were going back to Africa to have right. that fight. Right. So please talk about the behind the scenes, what it was like for your father, if you know that, um, how, um, you know, Muhammad Ali seemed very serene in that picture, what it was like for your father to connect and uh, capture Muhammad Ali in that moment, um, argu arguably before one of his um, best fights. Yes. So could you just reconstruct that scene? Thank sure, you much. sure, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, so my father was there apparently the entire time. So if you know about the Rumbling Jungle, it was a fight against Foreman. This was when um, they'd gone to Africa. He lost his belt, then he was banned from boxing. And so this was the fight for him to regain the title. People thought that Foreman was going to kill him because Foreman had beat Frazier and Frazier had beat Ali. Foreman beat Frazier so badly that people were really worried about Ali's health and he had been fighting for a while. So. They were in uh, Kinshasa, or it was called the Congo back then, they were in Kinshasa, uh, Zaire, um, and it was, I think they were there for maybe two months. So there was a festival in Zaire. So this was actually a Don King for, <laughs> event. So Don King did everything big. It, it would be like uh, the equivalent of like, you know, a, a Paul, you know, one of the Logan fights or whatever it is. So they did everything really big, um, and they, you know, they made it the Roman jungle, they had a title, the whole thing. Um, so they flew down and they were there for a couple months and then the foreman broke his hand and he wanted to leave because he wasn't having a good time there because people were really for Ali. But he was there the entire time. So there's actually roles of film with foreman as well that my father have. Uh, one was referenced in the New York Times article. But that time was really big because a lot of musicians had gone down to perform, so he has pictures from those concerts. And then he was going back and forth to each of the camps. Uh, he had a relationship, my father had a really tight relationship, both with Ali and Howard Bingham, who was Ali's photographer for most of his, 
most of his career. Um, and Bingham would say, hey, Kwame, I'll be on this side, you get on this side. So they, they kind of worked in tandem. Um, but the thing that was amazing about that picture is that it really captured, as, as you notice, it captured the spirit of that particular fight. Um, this was also after, and, and they reference it in the Ali movie with Will Smith, there's a point where Ali's wife is worried about him fighting. He's like, you think I'm gonna lose too? So before that picture's taken, there were there was a, an entire like PR like it was all there were a bunch of photographers, they were rolling cameras. So there's a bunch of images leading up to that, and you know Ali's Ali, he's hamming it up, he's talking smack, he's doing his whole thing. And so after that session had ended, my father was there for that as well. Those guys all left, and it was my father and Ali, and he was just sitting on the bench. And so he said, this was about. 45 minutes after everyone had gone, and he was just still just kind of sitting there in this, in this kind of introspective moment. And so my father just kind of, you know, took a step back and t took the shot. And it shows a different side of Ali, which I think is really beautiful. Um, I laughed though, because my father in 74, which is the year I was born, was with the Jackson Five in Africa. He was at another event, and he was there. I'm like, were you around? <laughs> were you there when I was born? He's like, no, I was there, I was there. Um, but no, it was um, it was this it was this iconic moment, and that's why the image it 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 took me. Uh, I was taken aback because when I saw it, I was like, "This is not like all the other." Because Ali was very aware of the camera; he was very aware of like what he was doing, and so the fact that he let that that vulnerable moment uh, take place was really really uh, incredible for me. Thank you for your presentation and thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, so I'm a student and there's something that I've been kind of thinking about in terms of art in the United States, particularly like black art. Mm -hmm. um, as we know, arts, artistic spaces are still controlled or the United States is controlled by money and art spaces are controlled by money. White people c control a lot of capital in the United States and particularly the art spaces are are still white. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if there, especially because the art that your father was producing is, you know, black is beautiful. The what you were talking about is the undergird method message was that it is for revolution. I was just wondering how or is is there an intention for your organization to kind of make sure that black people are able to access and see this art. Um, I know there are wealthy black people that are probably gonna be able to access these spaces, but I'm also really thinking about accessibility, inclusivity. Um, how does this message, um, you know, vision trickle down? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for that. I think um, you're 100% right. These spaces are not controlled by people who look like us, right? And so, um, there, there are gatekeepers, right? And so you have to understand, um, that's why I went back to school, to kind of learn how to navigate the world. Um, but, I, but the thing I do find is there's a community of artists and curators who understand the importance of, of those facts, right? And so, and, and that community of artists and curators, um, it's a multicultural community. So some of the, um, it was really interesting. So we're in the Art Institute of Chicago, which is a really, really incredible institution for art. Um, uh, and Elisa knows Michal, Michal Razrusso, had come to Black Portraiture. I was presenting at Harvard Art Museum in Black Portraiture, and I did a presentation, and I, someone asked a question about like, oh, what institutions have you been in? And I named a few. I wasn't gonna name all of them, I, I, I'm, like, I'm not egotistical, so I was just like, oh, let me just name a couple. So I named a couple, and she raised her hand, she goes, you forgot X, Y, Z, you know, all of these, all of these places. I was like, who is this woman, Jewish, you know, Jewish woman? And she was like, 
no, this work is really important and it has to be in these institutions. So there are allies all around. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that when you get into the institutions like, you know, the large museums that pe everyone can visit, that you know you can just go into. Um, obviously, not everybody. I'm sure this is open to the public here, like these museum exhibitions are open public here. But you know, how many of us are in the, <laughs> in Hanover, right? So how do you make sure that these pe that people get to see themselves represented? Um, one of the ways is that I often look for um, collaborations with other artists that are in those spaces already. And I also reach out to places where I want to see the work, right? And so part of it for me, like I, actually, I don't reach out to celebrities. It's great that they you know, purchase work, but when I'm seeking out where to place and where to do it, I want that work to be seen. So I'm reaching out to the places where there will be people that are young there are the up and coming curators, there are the up and coming you know, people who are gonna have influence, there, there are you know, engineers, there's computer scientists, there are everyone who then get to know this work and grow with it, right? And so uh, that is really important. Another thing that you know, we've done is I do a lot of licensing in books, and you know, the new uh, Say It Loud, uh, James Brown documentary is coming out, and we have a couple of images in there. And there's, you know, Luther Vandross coming out. That, that there are a couple images in there. So when people start to then see it in just normal places, right? You, you, it's, it's a, it's a concept in almost anything. You want multiple touch points for people to be able to experience the work. It's really important that that happens. One thing that was really critical for us was when we first started out. Jesse Williams, who's become a friend, who's the actor that was on Grey's Anatomy when his character had a change in like his place, you know, he had them call me and say, can we put this work in his space? So, which was amazing. Uh, we ended up licensing it. They couldn't, they couldn't buy it, but they, we licensed it. So now, whenever you showed his character at home, there's the picture of my mother on the wall, right? And so I remember being at our Basel which is a totally different space, right? And someone walked in and was like, hey, that's that Grey's Anatomy picture, right? And so being able to interact with people in different ways, in different spaces, is really important. Um, we're currently, I'm working with a group of uh, musicians who took uh, works that my father had done and wrote original music to it. And it's in kind of like a jazz genre. And so we're working on putting that out. And so. I want people to experience it because it was on an album cover and it was in Architectural Digest and it was in this book that I read about, you know, art and history. Uh, um, AP African American History, there's an image that will show up of what, as one of my father's as part of the AP African American test. That image will be there. So like being in spaces where, and it just doesn't have to be art spaces, being in spaces where people get to experience the work and they get to know who he is, um, the goal is to really kind of build on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. You're doing great work. It's absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Um, and I know you've got your hands full, but I'm also curious about what's next. Like, clearly you must have some dreams for big projects in the future, and we'd love to know about those. Yeah, you know, for me, um, I'm, so we're currently in three um, group exhibitions. The one here, thank you very much. Um, there's one at uh, Ken Kelba Gallery in New York. Uh, it's called Black Men in Passage, Long Journey Forward. Uh, that is a bunch of different photographers. It was curated by Howard Cash and Jamel Shabazz, so that's really beautiful. Um, and it's multi-generational. And then there's Giants, uh, the Dean Collection at Brooklyn Museum that is there through July. Um, and so for me, it's building on those things. We do have, um, you know, a uh, solo exhibition coming up at the Art Center in, in, in Pasadena. Uh, that will be in 
expanded version of the Art Center uh, exhibition that we had uh, in Chicago, uh, Art Institute of Chicago. Um, but I'm looking at trying to do more things that are collaborative, so working with other artists and reimagining the work in some ways. Um, we are currently working on a documentary um, and potentially a second book. Uh, those are the things that are kind of moving us forward. But ultimately, for me, um, goal number one is to really archive the work. It's, I, we have, I think we've released about 250 images. I think there are 10,000 scanned. There's probably another multiple of that, probably 10x that's out there that still needs to be kind of like housed, you know, um, archived, digitized, keyworded, and all those things. So that ultimately, you know, when my kids are, you know, working with the archive, uh, and hopefully sooner than that, if we can get some grant money and some donations, like there'll be opportunities for us to have a searchable database where, you know, what happens now, and this just happened, um, with Luther Vandross, the Luther Vandross documentary, uh, they reached out and was like, oh, this uh, image of Luther Vandross, your father took it. And I'd never seen it before. I was like, oh my gosh, I've seen that series of pictures, but he was so young that I actually didn't recognize him. And so I was like, oh, I know these images. So I went and found a couple, but there are probably 10 more roles, right? That I've never seen before because we ha we're still working through getting through the archives. So, that is goal number one. And you know, the projects that align and show, um, my father's the keeper, I am also the keeper, but I also feel like I'm the bridge. I, I feel like I'm the bridge between his generation and this generation that's coming on. And so, um, like that J. Cole song, like I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle, right? So it's like, it's, it's one of the things that is very important to me because I was sharing with Salisa earlier, the people who know him know him, right? His generation knows him. My generation is getting to know him. I want the people like you guys to, to, to you all, like coming up, understanding the work, understanding what, what the importance of it is so that when, you know, some curator that graduates from Dartmouth says, oh, I want to do this show, we have to have this work in with, you know, this, person who actually went to school with me, right? Because I think that conversation is extremely important to have. And, and, and one other thing that I would mention is that the, the image of my mother, the orange one, there's a different version where she's kind of turned slightly toward the camera. And he shot those images in 1968. So the, the kind of, you know, wow moment for me was the National uh, Museum of African American History and Culture reached out because it, they have that Afrofuturism um, exhibition that's open, opening. In the book, under Afrofuturism, is that image of her that was shot in 1968, and it's the visualization for Afrofuturism in 2024. So you talk about how the work that he was doing was both kind of nostalgic but contemporary. It's pretty amazing to cover that span, um, 68 to 2024, and it's, and it's the visual for Afrofuturism, so it's looking into the future. So. I love the fact that things like that are happening, and, and those are the things that are really important for me to really establish his 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 um, place in that kind of like Mount Rushmore of f photography. You mentioned, um, and thank you for the presentation, um, a couple of different iterations of images or a series. And so I was wondering how you feel sort of curating or representing your dad's work or choosing um, from the different imagery that you encounter. Um, and I was also wondering if what you're presenting were the final pics of your father. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. No, I, um, so when the pro process first started, 
what we would do is we would take a negative, we would scan it and kind of see, like, well, you know, it's like the at-home Epson scanner, right? What do we have? And then what I would do is we would send them to my father and say, what is this image? Because when we started the process, uh, and this was crazy, um, he could look, I remember I showed him a contact sheet of Bob Marley, and I said, you know, we have to, we have to organize this, we have to get this right. And I was like, so like, we have to know what date this is. He was like, that was uh, June 7th, 1976. And I was like, what? <laughs> he was like, yeah. I said, well, how do you know that? He goes, because, you know, that was in Philadelphia, and it was a couple of days before uh, Jimmy Carter had declared Black Music Month. I was like, why do you know that? He goes, because I was there at the White House when he did it. And I was like, oh, okay. Then I Googled it, and he, he was right, right? And so um, he, was, he was always a part of the process in the beginning part. Um, what wasn't kind of public knowledge um, as he started to, as his health started to deteriorate, was that he started to lose his vision, so he couldn't see him as well. So it, it went from sending them kind of on the computer to we got him like a really big screen TV so that he could see it still. Then when he kind of really just wasn't able to see uh, very much anymore, we'd, I, we'd had enough information about like those groups of images that we could then start making, okay, this is what that background looked like. This is you know what that person looked like. And so things like that. Now as the archive, and, and since it's passing in the last couple of years, we generally, what I do is, if I see an image and it looks like something that might be interesting, um, oftentimes I'm discussing it with you know, Philip or other curators who have then come in and say, hey, we'd like to do something, do you have new works? And generally, the works that you have seen have been things that have been curated because someone else has been very interested in it. And then occasionally we'll release things that we think are just amazing, right? Um, that was the case in the blue images, the, the blue image. That was when we were like, oh my gosh, we have to put this one out. There's another one of this um, woman standing in front of these. Uh, she's at like Marcus Garvey Park and she has this white dress on and she looks like, literally like an angel. Um, and, and I've heard people refer to it as the goddess image. Like there are certain things that we put out just because they're like, oh my gosh, this is absolutely stunning. Um, but generally it's come from um, working with Philip, kind of understanding what direction we want to go, um, and then out, some outside curation because people will then want to feature our work or um, put it in an exhibition or, or, or do like a group exhibition, things like that. So um, the process is, is, is continually growing. Uh, and one of the things that I would like to do is to, you know, continue to, to, to kind of comb through and figure out um, and then uh, kind of shift. Because the first book uh, was, uh, actually the genre apparently is dead now, but it's like the superhero movie. Like it, It's like the first of his, like the, just the introduction to like who he is. He's got like fashion, politics, you know, like there's so much stuff to put, like I could do probably seven books easily, but what direction do we want to go? What, what, what is, you know, what's happening in the world? How do we tell the stories, I think, in an appropriate way? Um, so we're, we're, we're thoughtful about that. Thank you everyone for coming. Oh, do we have one more Oh, yes. Um, thank you for coming out and, and being that bridge and introducing us um, to your father and yourself and the next generation coming. Um, my question is, is kind of along the, the mission statement uh, for the organization, but uh, I guess the, what I want to ask is how, how do you look for the, the next generation of creators, the creative people, uh, specifically in, in other art forms, I guess, outside of, of photography um, or things that would exist in the gallery? Like, what do you look for in the next generation of creators to, to for collaborations, I guess? Yeah, look, I think, thank you, first of all, for being here um, and the question. For me, it's, um, I, it's people who kind of live with that, I, I, that idea of like empowerment and equity, who live in that space. Um, I want to try to figure out ways in which they amplify their voices. So um, if it's, you know, being in an exhibition with that person or telling a curator, 
hey, you need to check out this work, which I've done quite a bit. Um, those are ways, and then you know, ultimately, when we when we get kind of, I think where I want the archive to be, I would love to kind of eventually set up some sort of like thing that actually helps fund, you know, projects or things like that. Um, and we're not there yet, but I but it is important, um, and it does. And we were specific about not necessarily just focusing on photography because there's so many different ways to tell stories. And with all the new technologies, there's so many different ways that I want to tell stories, right? So I want to take his photography and, you know, do some sort of AR. And, you know, Jackson's probably going to have to help me with that because um, I'm, I'm all right. But, you know, he's next level. So I think figuring out ways in which to work with people, figuring out ways, like, with these artists, with these, these one, one refers to jazz. He goes, it's not jazz, it's black American music. So working with these black American music artists, like how do you, um, how do you get in contact with their um, audience? How do you teach their audience and how do you learn from their audience? How do you figure out um, ways in which, which you can support? And sometimes it's financial, sometimes it's support by just, you know, mentoring, sometimes it's support by introducing people. Um, I've introduced a lot of artists to curators so that they can kind of get those things off the ground. Um, but also just, like I said in the beginning, I like to connect people to other people. So it's important that, you know, as mentors, as mentees, I still you know, speak to my mentors, how you kind of connect people to other spaces. And they don't have to, they don't always have to look like you, right? So I think what's, um, what's really incredible is when you can really open up and, you know, you can network this way, you can network that way, you can network this way so that you're constantly building um, a community. And that's what I, that's one of the things I love about being in the art world, it is a community. It really is, like there's, there's support, people are coming out for each other, um, people are supporting each other's talks and shows and things like that. So it's, um, it's, it's a good community to be in. Um, and so I, I, love the, I love being part of the creative community and, and, and being able to support that in any way I can. Thank you.